I was born on the 28th of February in Portland, Oregon, in the USA. My father died when I was quite young and my mother had a difficult time looking after us as we were really quite poor. I went to the state schools, which were free, in my area. In 1914, while I was at Washington High School, I saw a friend's chemistry experiment and I immediately became fascinated with the whole subject. I was lucky to win a scholarship to Oregon State University. Without it, it would have been impossible for me to go to university at all. Even with the scholarship, I still had to get a job and I worked all the way through my years at college until I got my BSc, Bachelor of Science degree in chemistry. While I was at college, I combined studying with teaching. One course I taught was chemistry for students whose main course was home economics. This was a class attended by a lot of girls and no boys. One of the girls, Ava Helle Miller, caught my eye and we became friends. It wasn't long before I decided she was the girl for me and on the 17th of June 1923, we got married. Life was good, but because we went on to have four children, we were also rather poor. Meanwhile, after graduating from university, I went to Caltech, the California Institute of Technology. I was interested in the structure of atoms and how they stuck together to form molecules. I started using X-rays to examine the molecular structure of crystals. This work led me to look at the link between physics and chemistry, and I began to apply what was known about quantum physics to chemistry. Using my new theories, I was now able to explain the molecular structure of many things that had been puzzling scientists for years. The discoveries I made in this field allowed many chemicals, dyes, plastics and synthetic fibers that are still being used today, to be developed. I published seven papers on this subject, got my Ph.D. doctorate in philosophy in 1925 and was invited to go to Europe to work with some of the great scientific minds of the time. I was given a Guggenheim Fellowship, which gave me enough money to live and study for the whole time I was away. This was an incredible experience for me, but by 1927, I had returned to Caltech as a staff member and became busy with research and experiments. I published 50 papers and established what was known as Pauling's Five Rules. By the age of 30, I became a full professor, a professor at the highest level, as well as continuing with my chemical research. The technical work was going very well but many other scientists questioned whether our findings at Caltech were of any use in real life. What they didn't know at the time were the truly enormous implications of our work, because chemical bonds, the way that atoms are held together, were the basis for a new generation of bomb, the atomic bomb. In 1932, I published what was called the Pauling Electronegativity Scale. The following year, I was elected to the National Academy of Sciences Gates and Krellin Laboratories, at Caltech. 
By 1939, I had written a textbook called The Nature of the Chemical Bond. I concentrated fully on my work. Finding it fascinating and at home, my wife and I were busy raising our family. Then from the distance came the news of war as the Germans started invading countries across Europe. Up to this point, I had not been involved in politics, but I realized that with my knowledge of chemistry and physics I had to do something, so I started research on explosives. I was also involved in medical research. A disease called sickle cell anemia, which makes people ill because it changes the shape of the blood cells was discovered to be a molecular disease. This of course was within my area of interest and with two colleagues, I was able to produce artificial antibodies to fight the disease. We also had a tremendous breakthrough when we discovered how to make a substitute for blood plasma, the part of the blood that cells live in. As it turned out, I also needed medical attention myself. I had been feeling tired and unwell for some time, more than just serious overwork could explain. Then I was diagnosed with a kidney disease that was often fatal. I was lucky enough to have a doctor who was trying out a new type of treatment that many thought was rather extreme. It involved drinking large amounts of water, and eating little protein. I followed this diet without fail for the next 15 years and, of course, I didn't die. In the meantime, the USA had entered the Second World War, when in 1941, the Japanese attacked American soil at Pearl Harbor. On the battlefields, the Germans had been beaten but the Japanese continued to fight and the decision was made to drop atomic bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. From this it became obvious to everyone what could happen when the theory of science, in this case the development of the atomic bomb, was used in real life. Horrified by the injuries caused by this type of bomb, decided I would focus on how we could prevent war. In 1946, I joined the Emergency Committee of Atomic Scientists, chaired by Albert Einstein. The committee had eight members in total. As a scientist, I knew only too well what damage exposure to radiation could do, but I saw that the general public were not being told about it. The ECAS was established to raise money so that the non-scientific community could be informed about the dangers of atomic bombs through lectures and written material. We decided that there were some very basic facts about atomic bombs that scientists worldwide would agree on and that should be made known to everybody. These basic facts were, atomic bombs can be developed so that they can cause more damage in the future. Other countries will also have the technology to be able to invent atomic bombs for themselves and they are not expensive and can be made in large numbers. There is nothing that can be used as a defense against atomic bombs. Not now 
nor will there ever be in the future. It is not possible for society to prepare for an atomic war. If atomic bombs are used in war, then civilization will be destroyed. The final and most important point was that the only solution is to control atomic energy and how it is used. Even though the ECAS stopped working as a formal organization in 1951, I continued giving speeches about the need for world peace, nuclear disarmament and, for me the most immediate concern, the end of nuclear testing. However, in 1954, it looked as if more wars were coming, with the Cold War with Russia underway, and the conflict in Korea starting. My views were seen as being unpatriotic by the general population and as a threat by the government, so my passport was taken away from me. At that time I had been awarded the Nobel Prize for Chemistry but now, without a passport, I couldn't go and collect it. Finally, due to pressure from abroad, the government gave in, gave me my passport and I went to Sweden with my family for the award ceremony. I took the opportunity while I was there to get other Nobel winners to support my anti-war cause but when I came back to the USA, trouble was waiting for me. I had to appear before a government committee to answer questions about my political views. Was I a communist? Or had I ever had links with communists? My answer was always, no, and I continued trying to stop nuclear bomb tests from taking place. On TV and radio and in newspapers, I gave many interviews and almost overnight I became a political figure even though I had not won an election. Pressure was put on me to reveal the names of other influential people who felt the same way as I did. But, although I was threatened with imprisonment, I refused. After this, my wife and I sent a petition to the United Nations with the signatures of more than 11,000 scientists demanding the end of nuclear testing. The government couldn't imprison 11,000 people, many of whom were foreign nationals. In 1962, these activities led to my being awarded another Nobel Prize, this one for peace. A year later I finally managed to meet President Kennedy, the President of the USA, and tell him my views face to face. At the time I wasn't sure if he agreed with me although he did listen to what I had to say. I must have had some impact because the first nuclear test ban was then announced. This was progress indeed, but I knew I had to keep up the good work. After 42 years at Caltech, I decided to resign and take up a new role to promote democracy and peace. However, I was not happy unless I was doing research, and by now my attention was moving towards health science. In 1967, I became professor of chemistry at the University of California, 
In San Diego and then two years later, I had the same role at Stanford University. In 1970, I published a book that created great interest, Vitamin C and the Common Cold. I argued that taking large amounts of vitamin C could reduce the symptoms of a common cold and could even prevent people from catching a cold in the first place. This advice is now taken by millions of people all over the world. In 1979, with Ewan Cameron, I published another book called Cancer and Vitamin C where we suggested that vitamin C had a role in preventing cancer. This theory was not widely accepted but after a great deal of debate, discussion and publicity with TV and radio interviews, it did lead the way to new research into how good nutrition can fight disease. As a result, the Orthomolecular Medicine Institute, where I became director at the age of 72, was renamed the Linus Pauling Institute of Science and Medicine. Ironically, my wife was suffering from cancer and in 1981, she died. Together we had developed a great partnership in the home and against war, and to keep my mind active, I continued working. I published more books, No More War, a 25th anniversary edition and also How to Live Longer and Feel Better, which was a title I was trying to live up to as I was, by the time, 85. These were books that everyone could read, not just scientists. New research on vitamin C and AIDS resulted in new treatments being developed, and doctors began looking at the role of vitamins in the treatment of heart disease. Despite having prostate cancer, which I fought with two lots of surgery and huge doses of vitamin C, I lived until the age of 93. Looking back over my life, some people said that I was the father of molecular biology, but I think I would like to be remembered for my efforts to secure world peace.